know that conspiracy theorists and futurologists who envision a dark future where humanity is enslaved by neural networks or reptilian aliens are well behind the times with their stories? After all, our world has long been dominated by other non-human creatures. What creatures, you might wonder? Let's put together some well-known facts and see where imagination takes us. These are very ancient and powerful creatures that have outlived not only dinosaurs, but absolutely everyone else. But before that, they played a vital role in the emergence of all other living things on the planet. These creatures can come in all forms, shapes, and sizes, ranging from the simplest unicellular organisms to complex, weirdly shaped branching structures. Today, we heavily rely on this mysterious kind. They literally saved thousands of human lives, yet just as easily, they could kill. And sometimes they do kill. But not of their own free will. Moreover, these beings can mutate like real superheroes. It is due to this ability that they survived all the global disasters known to science, evolved, adapted to new conditions, and truly populated land, water, and atmosphere. And even if the sun were to go out tomorrow, many of them wouldn't notice it and continue living as if nothing had happened. So, have you guessed it yet? Well, we're talking just about fungi. Although just may not be the appropriate wording here, given how astonishing they are. Some fungus facts you're going to learn today will surprise, delight, alarm, and make you happy all at the same time. Why are fungi closer to animals than plants? What kind of giant tree-tall mushrooms grew in ancient times? Where does the largest organism on Earth hide? Is it true that some fungi produce rocket fuel? How do fungi turn insects into zombies? Could fungi take over the world just like they did in The Last of Us? And much more fascinating stuff. Fungi. Your likes and subscriptions will go well beyond showing your appreciation. It's a way of sharing knowledge with the world and making it easily accessible for every viewer. Often, when you delve into the world of fungi, you quickly realize that you don't really know anything about them, especially about the role they played in the evolution of life. For example, a compelling theory suggests that fungi were the very first life forms on Earth. This is largely because the fungi prepared the ground, in the most literal sense, for future plants. If you are on land now, then all the living things that you see owe their existence to fungi. Take, for example, Tortutuberus protuberans, a small, inconspicuous, but resilient fungus. It is one of the earliest fungi known from fossil records, dating back to 440 million years ago to the early Silurian period. It was this fungus that, over countless generations, turned bare rocks into fertile soil. Naturally, it wasn't the only one responsible for this transformation, but its role was crucial. At the same time, fungi are just as diverse life forms as animals and plants, and may even surpass them. It's estimated that there are up to one and a half million species of mushrooms, but only about a hundred thousand have been studied so far. Interestingly, only 56 species of fungi are listed in the world's Red Book, compared to more than 25,000 plants and 68,000 animals. This means that there are almost a thousand times fewer protected species of fungi than rare animals. But most fungi are far from being endangered. 
They thrive in various conditions and are so abundant that certain species are now being used as raw materials for the production of substitutes for polystyrene foam, leather, and construction materials. This makes sense given fungi's impressive growth rate. For example, with a growth rate of up to 5 millimeters per minute, common stinkhorn is a real champion. No bamboo could ever grow so fast. Moreover, this mushroom is incredibly resilient. Its emerging fruiting body can exert pressure up to 1.33 kPa, which is enough to break through asphalt. There are also incredible bioluminescent mushrooms called Neothenopinus gardneri. We bet you thought such mushrooms could only grow on the planet Pandora from the movie Avatar. Fortunately, we can witness their captivating luminescence here on Earth. To do so, one would need to venture to Brazil. It's there that these amazing green bioluminescent mushrooms emerge during the rainy season. Just take a look at this mesmerizing sight. What makes it even more impressive is that there is no artificial enhancement or luminescent paint involved, just actual mushrooms that evolved in this bizarre way. There is also something predatory about this ominous glow. And by the way, predatory fungi are a thing. Some types of fungi prey on nematode worms, luring them into a trap. Overall, there are more than 200 such predatory fungi species. The vibrant colors taken by mushrooms sometimes makes us doubt if they are real. For example, a mushroom could have this deep sky blue color, as if a child had poured a jar of gaucher on it. Do you think it's Photoshop? Well, it's not. This species is called Entoloma hoshtateri. It grows in New Zealand and may also be found in Australia and India. This mushroom has reddish spores, while the rest of the body is completely blue. The hue is attributed to the azuline pigment, which is also present in some marine invertebrate species. There have been attempts to cultivate the mushroom in the laboratory for its aesthetic qualities, but so far they've been unsuccessful. It might be for the best. While the mushroom isn't edible, its exact toxicity remains under-researched. But you wouldn't dare to eat this eerie-looking mass under any circumstances. And it's good that you don't want to. This fungus is extremely bitter, although it's not toxic. The fungus goes by a lot of names of varying expressiveness. Among others are bleeding tooth, and strawberries and cream. It can be found in the fall in the coniferous forests of North America, the Pacific Northwest, Europe, Iran, and Korea. In the United States, its range extends as far north as Alaska and as far east as North Carolina. In the Puget Sound region of Washington State, it commonly accompanies Douglas fir, silver fir, and hemlock. Along the Oregon coast, it is spotted under pine trees. Then, there is also this fungus. You may ask, where is the fungus? It looks like a set of cups with some leftovers, right? Or a strange bird's nest with even stranger eggs. But, in fact, this is a true fungus. Nigularia ACE, predominantly found in New Zealand. The shape of the bird's nest, which earned the fungus its name, is an ingenious solution for spreading spores. These cup-like structures accumulate rainwater and contain maturing spore containers resembling eggs. Eventually, these eggs rupture, shooting spores over distances of up to one meter. Surprisingly, this fungus, which looks like a bobtail dog, is edible, despite its extremely unappetizing appearance. This is Heresium erinaceus, or bearded hedgehog. 
It grows in many places, particularly in Russia and northern China, and is commonly found throughout the northern hemisphere. It tastes like shrimp meat. This fungus is also used for medical purposes, to increase immunity and treat chronic gastritis, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, and leukemia. In recent years, the fungus has become the subject of quite extensive research. The bearded hedgehog has a lot of promising qualities and could emerge as a powerhouse in the pharmaceutical world. Here comes another one. This one is called Devil's Cigar. How do you like this name? And here's what this fungus looks like. Not only does it have an original name, but it's considered virtually the rarest fungus on the planet. It is also referred to as the Star of Texas because it occurs only here, in the central part of the state, and in two other places in Japan. With its spores inside, the fungus looks something like a brown capsule, resembling an actual cigar. After the fungus opens to spread spores, it looks like a star or a regular cactus flower. The devil's cigar is the only fungus in the world that makes a whistling sound when expelling spores. Maybe that's why it acquired such an ominous name. And here's another one. Believe it or not, this is also a fungus. Its scientific name is Azroruba. It is also referred to as Anemone stinkhorn, sea anemone fungus, or starfish fungus. If you've never seen one, chances are you haven't been to Australia, where Azroruba is quite common. But there's a reason why this fungus looks nothing like a fungus. It resembles the staplia that many people grow as a houseplant, or the world's largest flower, the raphslea. In addition to the fact that both these plants and the fungus look alike, they also employ flies in their reproduction. While flowers use flies to transfer pollen, Australian fungus use them to transfer spores. The fact is that staplia, Rafflesia and C. anemone fungus emit the smell of rotten meat, which attracts flies. In addition to being weirdly shaped, many fungi have highly unusual chemical compositions. Some species are so chemically complex that scientists still cannot understand what makes them poisonous. And some types of fungi are worthy of real rocket science. For example, Gyromitra esculenta, produces a substance called gyromitrin. Although it's a poison in itself, if someone is unlucky enough to ingest it, they will die. Not because of this substance, but rather its derivative. The thing is, inside the human body, gyromitrin gets hydrolyzed into monomethylhydrazine, a primary ingredient in one of the types of rocket fuel. Some of these fungus facts sound absolutely incredible. How do these organisms manage to combine such qualities? So far, we've discussed only a small part of what fungi are capable of. Stay tuned for many more amazing discoveries. In general, there is something alien about fungi. Not to imply that they really come from another planet. Although, who knows? but in the sense that they are very strange and captivating at the same time. And it's not just lay people who see fungi in this sort of dreamy fashion. Some scientists share it too. Here, we could use a brief overview of what actually makes fungi, unlike anything else, and if they really are some kind of alien life form. Let's start with the basics. You probably know that fungi are the third kingdom of life, along with animals and plants. However, many people will be surprised to know that fungi are generally closer to animals than to plants. This might be a little unsettling. Almost no one thinks of trees as relatives of wolves, snakes, or anybody else from the animal kingdom. Yet, when it comes to fungi, 
which are extremely plant-like in the way they look and behave, things get a little bit tricky. But wait, it gets more interesting. The cell walls of fungi contain chitin. This is the same substance that ensures the strength of the shells of insects, arachnids, and crustaceans. Of course, this doesn't make fungi cousins to cockroaches, but it still makes them radically different from both kingdoms of nature. At the same time, the cell turgor, or the internal pressure in fungi, is comparable to plants, ranging from 5 to 10 atmospheres. This is significantly higher than in animals whose cell turgor is barely one atmosphere above normal external pressure. Another revelation for many will be discovering what actually constitutes a fungus. Typically, we refer to this as a fungus. However, more accurately, this is what a fungus actually is. That is mycelium. This is what constitutes a complete organism. And what we are used to is just a fruiting body, that is, an organ of reproduction. It's the same deal as with, say, an apple tree. The tree itself is the organism, while the apples are fruiting bodies or reproductive organs. Since we are on the subject of reproduction, it's worth going into more detail. It's no secret that fungi reproduce by spores. With a big stretch, this can be compared to how plants reproduce using seeds. However, there's one more thing that makes fungi closer to plants in this regard, and that is their ability to reproduce in different ways, including by spores, fragments of mycelium, and even particles of the fruiting body. Their reproductive strategies are often very ingenious. For example, imagine you bought regular oyster mushrooms at the store. The usual oyster mushrooms in their usual packaging. Sometimes you come across specimens that have caps in different places, with a characteristic white fluff appearance closer to the stem. Some people even avoid buying such mushrooms, thinking that it's some kind of mold and they have gone bad. But in fact, this indicates a process of secondary growth. Having found itself in an extreme and dangerous environment, on a supermarket shelf, the mushroom is, in fact, trying to escape and survive at all costs. To do this, the fruiting body itself begins to form its own mycelium, at first resembling white fluff. The fungus uses it to try to find some nutrient substrate nearby in order to cling to it. Thus, the oyster mushroom seems to be trying to break free from this terrible place. Yes, even mushrooms don't want to end up as someone's food. But what do they eat? And how? And here's another thing that fungi and animals have in common. It lies in the way they eat. While plants synthesize organic matter from inorganic substances, like carbon dioxide and water, through photosynthesis, both animals and fungi obtain ready-made organic compounds from their food. But unlike animals, fungi don't swallow food, but absorb it through the cellular surface, which makes them similar to plants. Many fungi are saprotrophs, meaning they consume organic matter from dead organisms. Yep, no matter how yucky it sounds, for the most part, fungi are scavengers. So how can we now reconcile this fact? Quite easily, actually. Especially considering how many benefits fungi bring to people and how many lives have already been saved with just penicillin alone. But there is much more to fungi than these amazing facts. Their myriad forms alone are breathtaking and, at times, almost surreal. Because this, this, and this are all fungi. Fungi can also look like this, which makes us wonder if these creatures are really from our planet. Well, when you look at how the slime and mold behaves and that it can actually crawl, you can't help but think 
Thank God they're at least small. We tend to think that fungi are small. And that's even despite the fact that the largest living organism on Earth today is the honey fungus. Honey fungus. And one that's been around for 8,000 years. Here you need to keep in mind what we explained a bit earlier in the video. A fungus is not something that sticks out above the ground, but something that is hidden under it. Well, this humongous honey fungus grows in the Malore Nature Reserve in Oregon and consists of a giant multi-ton mycelium sprawling over an area of 2,240 acres, 910 hectares. Its weight may reach 35,000 tons, which makes it also the most massive living organism in the world. But still, something feels off here. Why should we care about what's hidden underground? In fact, we tend to be impressed by what's above it. And in this regard, the fruiting bodies of fungi are not particularly impressive when it comes to size. But it wasn't always the case. During the Silurian and Devonian periods, from 470 to 360 million years ago, the Earth was home to some real fungal monsters. They were several times taller than the tallest plant in those times. We're talking about prototaxites. These giant mushrooms grew over 8 meters, 26 feet tall, and were up to 1 meter thick. To put this in perspective, the tallest plant of the time, Coxonia, was no taller than 100 centimeters, 40 inches. Imagine entire forests without a single tree. Fungi and mosses then covered the only supercontinent, Gondwana. The massive trunks of prototaxites served as fruiting bodies. It's staggering to ponder the extensive underground mycelial networks they might have had, although no evidence of such remains. Some scientists suggest that prototaxites are not pure fungi, but rather lichens, symbiotic organisms of fungi and algae. So, perhaps, they were able not only to feed on the substrate through the mycelium, but also to photosynthesize. Sadly, these towering pillars exist now only as fossils, and very rare ones at that. One can't help but wonder what would have happened if the prototaxites had survived to this day. What use would we have found for them? How would they evolve? Would they have become terrible poisonous weeds, like some kind of hogweed, or, on the contrary, nutritious and tasty food? There has yet to be a general consensus among scientists as to the fungi's role in our life. Should we consider them friends or enemies, especially in the future? The question is indeed very ambiguous, and cinema keeps on showing us the darkest scenarios. Let's try to figure it out. So, what makes fungi our friends, and why would we call them that? Well, firstly, let us remember that fungi carefully prepared all the conditions for the emergence and development of plants. The previously discussed fungus, Tortutubus protuberans, grew near coastlines and rivers on the supercontinents Gondwana and Laurentia in the regions that later became New York, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, and Scotland. But in those days, life in these places was far from thriving. On land, signs of life were sparse. Bacteria, algae, early plants, and perhaps some of the first land arthropods. And if it weren't for the mushrooms, everything would probably remain that way. After all, early fungi like Tortutubus, despite their modest size, had the superpower of being able to break down almost anything using digestive enzymes. These enzymes can be so powerful that they are able to erode hard rock. Given enough time and natural erosion, 
Many fungi can turn rocky soil into fertile ones, where plants can sink their roots. Therefore, complex life on land such as vascular plants might never have existed if Tortutubus and its fungal predecessors had not prepared the ground. But the role of fungi in early evolution didn't end there. When plant life began to spread and diversify on land during the Devonian period, fungi came to the rescue once again. Some scientists believe that the first land plants used symbiotic fungi in their roots to collect and transport nutrients. In fact, most plants still do this today. If you pull the plant out of the soil, you will likely see a lot of soil stuck to the small white hairs on the roots. These hairs are actually tufts of nutrient-absorbing tendrils called hyphae. This is how fungi grow in symbiosis with a plant. These fungal structures are incredibly important in creating the right soil composition. They help stabilize acidity and retain moisture and nitrogen. So without fungi, the soil would be nothing more than barren dirt. Okay, but that's all in the distant past. Why do people need fungi now? Besides the most obvious benefits like edible mushrooms and penicillin-derived antibiotics, this is where many might find themselves surprised, even those who thought they knew a lot about fungi. The cumulative positive impact that fungi offer to humanity significantly outweighs the risks. First of all, fungi have enormous potential in terms of food innovation. For example, the idea of creating mushroom meat is gaining traction as a viable alternative to traditional animal-based products. Additionally, it solves many ethical problems along the way. Fungi can accumulate substances that can't be stored in plants or fruits. Therefore, they can become real animal food alternatives. Secondly, fungi can be an unexpectedly rich source of new materials, including construction materials, clothing, artificial leather, furniture, composite materials, and much more. Fungal-based technologies are a new development in biorefinery. In fact, they have the potential to treat any wastewater, be it urban, hospital, or industrial. Substantial funding is now being poured into R&D in this field, and a lot of projects are underway. A lot of useful and amazing things are being created. We'll likely see fungi becoming one of the most reliable and efficient allies of humanity in the next couple of decades. But could there be a different scenario? Could fungi become a growing threat to us? Unfortunately, this is already happening. Indeed, the number of fungi dangerous to humans increases every year. And we are not talking about those fungi growing in the forest, and not even about those spoiling crops and food in warehouses. We are talking about those who wouldn't mind growing in our own bodies. Scenes from The Last of Us might already flash before your eyes, but the reality is less dire, albeit concerning. There is a plausible hypothesis suggesting that the invention of antibiotics opened up ways for fungi to enter human bodies. All kinds of mycosis and other fungal diseases were extremely rare back in the 19th century. Nowadays, such cases are becoming more and more prevalent. The medical world responds to this by inventing not antibiotics, but antimycotics. However, the success so far is quite modest. Thanks to their incredible ability to mutate at lightning speed, fungi quickly develop resistance to drugs. This potentially sets the stage for an extended tug of war between humans and fungi. Yet, the end game might not be annihilation, but collaboration. The thing is that technically, we aren't enemies of fungi. Fungi have been around on the planet for so long and have already gone through so much that they hardly even notice us. Metaphorically speaking, the fungi haven't yet decided what we mean to them and what to do with us next. Of course, it takes a leap of imagination 
to envision an underground fungal government deliberating its expansion plans. But if you were to review the whole course of evolution and see the big picture, it's exactly this metaphor that would come to mind. As a result, the fungi may quote unquote decide that we don't pose a threat to them, which is the most likely scenario. All metaphors aside, the interaction between humanity and fungi may eventually balance itself out. Fungi definitely don't need to destroy everything around them. Like all living beings, their primary goal is to reproduce. The same thing happens with viruses. New viruses are often very aggressive and quickly kill the infected person. However, this rapid progression also hinders their spread as the host often dies before transmitting the virus to others. Eventually, as it mutates, the once deadly virus takes on a non-lethal benign form, like an acute respiratory infection, and gets complacent. The virus and humans live in the same environment without causing each other too much trouble. The balanced fungi-human coexistence can be based exactly on this principle. The only difference is that you can't make eco-leather or polystyrene foam substitute from viruses, but you can easily make them from fungi. Moreover, you can eat a juicy mushroom steak, which also can't be made from viruses. However, although this is the most likely, it's at the same time the most optimistic scenario. We must admit, nature doesn't always take the most favorable course. And finally, we come to what many have been waiting for. How plausible are the events in the universe of The Last of Us? The idea that some kind of fungus could do such terrible things looks too far-fetched. It's hard to believe that something could turn people not just into zombies, but zombies of different types, each with their unique abilities. Now, brace yourselves for what's coming next. Because all this is largely true. But of course, we should mention some caveats. Let's first go into some vivid examples, then circle back to this point. There are quite a few fungi that prefer to parasitize the bodies of other living beings. They literally eat their hosts alive. And some hosts even like it. For example, the parasitic fungus Massospora targets cicadas. Its life cycle is eerily reminiscent of a horror film plot. The fungus infects young male cicadas as they mature underground. Then it waits for them to come to the surface when the insects are ready to mate. The fungus then eats away the cicada's abdomen and genitals, replacing them with its own spores. The cicada is left with mere fragments of its shell and a mass of fungal material in place of its abdomen. Astonishingly, the insect remains oblivious as the fungus chemically manipulates its brain, prompting the male to flirt with other males by actively flapping their wings thus imitating female mating behavior. The infected carrier attracts healthy males who, in their attempt to mate, become infected with the spores and subsequently spread the infection further. There are at least two species of Massospora that use psychoactive chemicals to manipulate their prey into a desired state. Such stupefied cicadas stop feeding and only try to reproduce but at this stage, they no longer even have genitals or any internal organs. Nonetheless, these disoriented insects just keep on trying. During their courtship, they infect more and more healthy cicadas. As a result, the fungus successfully spreads until the effective insect dies from damage and exhaustion. Unfortunately, such outbreaks leave entire cemeteries of emaciated cicadas. But that's the deal with Massospora. What about the fungi depicted in the television series? Meet Cordyceps, a very famous species that is even more efficient at enslaving other living creatures. They can literally zombify ants and control their behavior. 
When the ant is infected, the cordyceps mycelium penetrates its circulatory system. At the same time, the fungus doesn't affect the nervous system because it will still need to control the ant. Then, the mushroom makes the insect climb higher on some branch. Firstly, this is how the fungus gets the best temperature and humidity parameters. Secondly, it can infect healthy inhabitants of the anthill more efficiently from above. Cordyceps then grows a fruiting body on the ant's head and kills the insect, leaving it hanging on the branch and spraying spores around. However, ants aren't that stupid and try their best to avoid cemeteries littered with the corpses of their fungus-infected fellows. So, all this is fascinating, yet it begs the question, how? How is this possible? Scientists don't yet have a definitive answer, only general conclusions, and they are simple and mind-blowing at the same time. It turned out that just like Massospore stupefying cicada, Cordyceps uses a cocktail of chemicals to execute a precise behavior control. However, in this case, we're talking about dozens of substances, and sometimes even more than a hundred. Each substance plays a specific role in manipulating the ant's behavior. You see, it's as if the fungus has levers, like those in an excavator's cabin. And it doesn't matter that these levers are chemical. It can pull them the same way an invisible puppeteer would pull the strings of the doll. And let's just keep in mind that this doesn't happen in movies, but in nature. If you understood everything until this point, you would definitely come to wonder if cordyceps is so efficient at zombifying ants, can it zombify, say, a mouse or something even larger in the same way? This is more of a challenge. The fact is that cordyceps can't survive in environments hotter than 34 degrees Celsius, 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The normal temperature of the human body is 36.6 degrees, 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And in many animals, it's even higher. So it might seem we're safe. But even the film poses a tricky question. What if cordyceps mutates, for instance, due to global warming, enabling it to withstand high temperatures. What would happen then? Are we doomed? Were the writers of the show right? Opinions on this topic vary widely. On the one hand, a person is not an ant, and it might be impossible for a fungus to control their behavior. But, on the other hand, it's a well-known fact that other parasitic life forms can control the behavior of mammals. One classic example referenced by scientists is Taxoplasma, an intercellular parasite that can asexually reproduce in human tissue cells. Cats are the primary carriers of this parasite, with humans occasionally serving as secondary hosts. Typically, the parasites target mice, Infected rodents lose their fear of cats, instead becoming attracted to their scent, making them easy prey. So much for behavior manipulation. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. You won't believe what's coming next. These parasites can also control human behavior with a wide range of influences. Infected people often display heightened risk-taking and thrill-seeking behavior, slower reaction, decrease in novelty-seeking, a tendency towards oversharing, and so on. That is, even skeptics should acknowledge that there is nothing biologically preventing the zombification of large organisms, and it all comes down to the extent of this control, from inducing slight behavioral changes to seizing complete control and even driving the host to suicide. This is something many people would find unsettling. Another aspect of the series that intrigued many was the depiction of signal transmission through an underground fungal network. The idea is that by disturbing the network in one place, 
you risk summoning zombies from an unknown remote location. So, can a fungus actually transmit information through its mycelium? Maybe it can, but definitely not in the same way that was shown in the film. Here, the filmmakers have certainly taken creative liberties. Firstly, the moving hyphae were a big exaggeration. An over-the-top reaction of the female scientist was quite natural in the film. Any mycologist would be horrified to see fungi moving before their very eyes. Because in reality, fungi move in the same way as plants. They don't exhibit any animal-like features here. Moreover, it is highly unlikely that cordyceps could evolve into a mobile species so quickly. Secondly, let's talk about the aforementioned chemical signal transmission through fungal hyphae. While this is a reality, it occurs at a much slower rate than signal transmission through the human nervous system or network cables. The nerve impulse in our body is transmitted through ions, charged particles, moving at speeds of up to 120 meters 390 feet per second. In contrast, chemical signals move through mycelium at a snail's pace, or even slower. So, while information is indeed transmitted through the mycelium, it happens very differently, serves a different purpose, and produces different effects than what was depicted in the series. According to experts, the way the most recognizable zombie, the so-called clicker, was portrayed in the film adaptation was more or less accurate. Its most distinctive feature was right on its head. Mycological experts who have reviewed the series identify this as sclerotia, a complex structure that serves basic functions in typical fungi, but has managed to evolve into an echolocation organ in this monster. And it's clear from how well the sclerotium is developed that this creature no longer needs eyes. It can perfectly navigate without them. Clicker's movements are jerky, twitchy, and constrained, which is also what one might expect, although its grip is very strong. The way it moves has a lot in common with the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease when a patient's motor control is significantly compromised. And this also makes sense. The fungus wouldn't make its victims move gracefully like a swan. It simply doesn't need it. By the way, the film also does a great job of showing the stages of how these terrible creatures develop from an affected person. Let's go through them briefly to get the whole picture. Runner. The fungus grows in the body of a living person, taking over their consciousness and making them hyper-aggressive this is the runner stage. This behavior can be explained by the fact that the fungus needs to spread spores to increase the affected area and claim new hosts. The runner looks like a typical zombie from any trash zombie movie. If there are fungal growths, they are small, and there are few of them. Upon spotting a player, it charges at them and can withstand three shots from small firearms. The least dangerous situation is when you meet just one runner, but they can pose a significant threat when encountered in groups. Although this wasn't so evident in the film, this fact becomes much clearer in the game. Stalker As the fungus progresses, it grows into the tissue and damages the skull, gradually resulting in vision loss. This is how the stalker stage develops. Stalkers are more dangerous than runners. They have more fungal growths throughout the body, higher vitality, and better hearing. Unique among the infected, they have the ability to hide and strike when least expected, setting them apart from the aggressive yet mindless runners. Clicker. To compensate for the loss of vision, the infection develops a primitive form of echolocation leading to the clicker stage, which was so accurately depicted in both the film and the game. Bloater. Over a long period of time, dense growths of fungus form throughout the victim's body. This is how the bloater stage develops. Bloaters represent an even more dangerous type of fungal mutant zombie. 
Shambler. An alternative progression of the disease results in the formation of Shambler. It is very similar to the bloater, but has a differently looking upper body and visible face. The Rat King. Last but not least, the most terrible and vile creature that Cordyceps managed to create in the universe of The Last of Us was the Rat King. It is a force to be reckoned with and is only encountered once in the game. This huge monstrosity is a superorganism formed from the very first infected of Seattle, who were placed in the hospital basement at the very beginning of the apocalypse. It is huge, strong, and terrifying. Perhaps we'll see it in future seasons of the series. Indeed, a mere glimpse of these nightmarish creatures can overwhelm even those with nerves of steel. After all, it looks like humanity is doomed. At most, it takes two days for the parasite to reach the brain after infecting the host. The incubation period is considered complete when the fungus seizes control over all body systems and turns a person into a runner. And that's it. There is no turning back. That's why viewers are grappling with one important question. When asked by a military man what to do, mycologist Ibu Ratna answered, bomb. This left some of the audience bewildered, and for good reason. Was there really any point in bombing the city? Absolutely not. This decision wasn't just peculiar, it was downright insane and suicidal. Here, the scientist seems to be on the team of fungi rather than on the side of humanity. Because any mycologist knows that for the most part, fungi can reproduce in any way they like, by spores, mycelium fragments, or even particles of the fruiting body. We talked about this at the beginning of the video. So once again, there was no point in bombing the city. It would serve to expedite the spread of the infection as materials capable of disseminating cordyceps would be propelled into the air, potentially spreading across the planet within 10 days. You might say, all right, but if bombing wasn't the answer, what was? What should the authorities have done to prevent the spread of the terrible fungal infection? The answers here are as complicated as the question itself. The first option is total isolation. The first of the few things that decision makers could and should have done was to completely quarantine regions exhibiting unmotivated aggression outbreaks. Considering that people from different parts of the city could have worked at that ill-fated flour mill, at least the entire city should have been isolated. As a matter of fact, stopping all international communications with the entire country would be a necessary step regardless of the potential repercussions on national or global economies. The second option is control. Implementing rigorous and comprehensive population screening is the second option. Given that the film depicted electronic infection detectors, we can assume such intricate technology was around. Healthy residents would have to be moved to green zones, ensuring that they are protected against infected intruders. Optimally, these green zones should also be protected against other ways the fungus could potentially spread. The third one is finding a cure. The third option is to direct all intellectual, scientific, and technical efforts towards solving the problem at its root. That is, inventing a medicine. And what we mean by medicine here encompasses a wide range of stuff. The scientist Ibu Ratna in the film was right about the fact that there are no vaccines for this and there can never be one. This is true and there are a number of valid reasons for this. However, vaccines aren't humanity's sole weapon against diseases. We'll let you in on a little secret. The kingdom of fungi is essentially as competitive as that of animals. However, in fungi, all that survival of the fittest drama happens much more slowly and behind the scenes. 
But experts have already learned to use some fungi to destroy others. People still somehow fight real fungi infections, right? Thrush, lichen on the skin, and even regular dandruff are all the result of fungal activity. And we have found efficient ways to deal with all this. Therefore, defeating such a terrible enemy as mutated cordyceps is only a matter of time and the collective effort of everyone who could contribute. Overall, it turns out that despite its exaggerations and creative liberties, the Last of Us series isn't as far-fetched as it might seem. Returning to our initial point, fungi have already taken over the world, but not yet in the same sense as in the Last of Us series. For now, fungi and humanity coexist in a biological balance. By the way, despite this coexistence, each species has vastly different odds of survival. Shall we draw a comparison? From a temperature survival standpoint, there seem to be equal odds. Some types of fungi can tolerate temperatures exceeding 80 degrees Celsius. On the other end, fungi don't die in sub-zero temperatures. They merely transition to a dormant state, while humans have clothing and other delights of civilization. In this aspect, it's a tie. The odds are evenly matched. What about oxygen? Humans need it to breathe, but not all fungi do. Fungal spores have been found in all layers of the atmosphere, even in the most rarefied ones, leading scientists to posit that fungi can spread and survive in space. Furthermore, pandemics and artificial intelligence don't care about fungi, but they affect humans. The doomsday clock is now counting down the last 90 seconds, but only for humanity. Also, let's not forget nuclear winter and radiation. Even though they kill all living things, they actually stimulate fungal growth processes. This was shown by the black fungi discovered in Chernobyl's Pripyat, thriving within the emergency reactor's sarcophagus after the nuclear disaster. Subsequent research by U.S. scientists confirmed that in environments with radiation levels 500 times above the norm, certain fungi types exhibited a three-fold increase in biomass growth. All right, let's say that humanity has less chance of surviving a global disaster than fungi. But are there any chances against fungi themselves if we were to engage in a hypothetical confrontation? Scientists think no. Scientists are certain that we stand a chance. Let's explain why. Firstly, those fungi that live in the human body today have been our companions for millions of years, living harmlessly without usurping control or claiming new organs or parts of the body. They are content only with what they have inherited. Meanwhile, modern medicine continues to make progress in combating undesirable fungi. Secondly, the real-world cordyceps differs significantly from its fictional counterpart portrayed in the TV series, as it predominantly paralyzes insects rather than humans. The argument of a rapidly evolving subspecies does not apply here. Regarding cytoseps, scientists reassure us that humanity can rest easy for at least several tens of millions of years. This fungus is a species-specific parasite, typically infesting one insect species, jumping not just to a different species, but an entirely different class of animals is not a matter of chance, but of millions of years of evolution. So, can humanity really feel safe and not be afraid that fungi would take over the world like in the series? Concerning cytosepts, absolutely. But, as for the one and a half million unexamined fungal species,